Marilyn? Gouda? And Marilyn, is there something you'd like to say? Yes. I was baptized and accepted Jesus as my Savior when I was 12, but I was baptized by sprinkling, and I have come to believe that it's important to be immersed, and so that's why I'm being baptized again today, and I love the Lord very much. Marilyn, I have a word for you. Uh, age has nothing to do with it, being a person that talks to people about the Lord, and I'm going to pray for boldness for you, to you would be able to talk to people about the Lord and tell them your story about the Lord. It's very important at the times, the way that things are nowadays, to reach out to as many people as you possibly can. So, Good, I need that. <laughs> yeah, we all do. <laughs> Lord, I, I just thank you for Marilyn uh, boldness, and I just ask that you give her wisdom and boldness to help others uh, to understand how important it is to come to you, as, to know you as Lord and Savior. So I just ask, Father, that you give her peace and give her understanding who she's supposed to speak to and when she's supposed to speak to people. Marilyn, I baptize you. I baptize you now in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Other churches do practice that. Amen. Uh, we do not because we believe that baptism is a personal response that a person makes to the Lord Jesus Christ. But we do believe in the importance of uh, dedicating a child to the Lord. And the reason for that, what we are doing when a parent dedicates their child to the Lord, they're saying to God, we want your will, your plans, your purposes to be fulfilled in our child's life. Without a dedicated commitment to that purpose on the part of the parent, it's so easy for all of us to exert our own will, our own desires, our own plans upon our children's life. And all we do is mess them up when we do that. And we don't want to mess our children up. Uh, we know the best person to be able to influence a child's life is the Lord. And so we are dedicating little Bowen to the Lord, wanting his will, plans, and purposes to be fulfilled. The second thing that we are asking for is that the, the Lord would grace both Luke and Jennifer with gifts of the Holy Spirit to anoint them and grace them to be able to parent little Bowen. And so this is what we're going to pray for. So uh, I'm going to invite you just to, to do something that was true uh, in the Old Testament, a sign of blessing to extend your right hand out as a statement of blessing this way. Uh, believe me, if I go long, your hand gets tired. There's nothing spiritual in endurance contest. I've seen how long it goes. If you get tired, you can put your hand down. Uh, but I want to I wanna get behind you guys and pray for you. I'm, I'm not going to do anything. I'm right here, Bo, and that's okay. <laughs> Lord, I want to come before you and I hold up... Um, this family to you. And in behalf of both, both Luke and in behalf of Jennifer and the balance of a wonderful family that supports and surrounds them, who I've had the privilege of knowing for many years now, that, Lord, we come before you and, and bring little Bowen to you and saying, Lord, first of all, we receive him as a gift from you because we know that every good and perfect thing comes from you. And this is a great gift that you've given to Luke and Jennifer. And that, Lord, we now simply say, we give him to you, not in the sense of the responsibility of parenting him, but we give him to you in the sense of we're asking that your will, your plans, your purposes would be both fulfilled and lived out in his life. What you want to have take place in his life we surrender that right to you. And we pray that you would then, in turn, that you would both grace Luke and Jennifer, that I know that there's uh, nothing that comes with this to help us to be able to parent children. Uh, we're on a serious learning curve when we have children. 
Thank you that we have the word that helps us. And thank you, Lord, that you've given us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit helps us and graces us in so many different ways. So I pray, even right now, that the Holy Spirit would both anoint and would gift Luke and Jennifer uh, with gifts of your Spirit for, maybe not in this moment, but in times in the future, when they need grace and energy that you would impart it to them, when they don't know how to answer a question that both knowledge and wisdom would be given to them, that you would grace them when there'd be difficult times that they might face, that you would prepare them to know the answers and how to guide and, and be able to take little Bowen through those times. Thank you for your grace and thank you that, Lord, that you have set yourself to partner with them in the raising of Bowen. Bless this family, I pray now, in the name of Jesus. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bless you guys. I want to get into a message. We started this last weekend a series that uh, I have started. I haven't given it a title. Uh, the focus of it is, is just starting to take a look at who is the Lord called us to be as his people. Uh, this is true as us as believers, and some of the things that we'll take a look at is truths that are unique to us as being people of Springfield Faith Center. But um, I'm not so much focusing in on teaching of uh, truths that he's wanting us to know about. What I'm trying to talk about is who does he want us to be? So, for example, this last weekend, we talked about that we get to be servants, servants of the Lord, and we get to serve people that God considers to people who are great are not the most powerful people, but people who are willing to serve, uh, that Jesus modeled this in, uh, for us, even when he lived here on earth. And that's not just something that he was when he lived here on earth. It speaks of something of who he is, as, whether he is as God or as human. He still serves, and it's an example that he wants us to learn because it's how the kingdom of God functions. Today, I want to start focusing on another truth of something that he wants us to be. He wants us to be people who are about his kingdom business. He wants us to be people who are about the activity that he has called us to be involved with. And so I want to uh, have some fun and do this in a kind of a, a unique way as we get started in the topic for, for today. Uh, in times past, uh, something that the church has done for a long period of time is to uh, take secular music and then tweak it and make it Christian. <laughs> it's what I call redeeming a song. Uh, and so it's been true for a long period of time. So for example, Charles Wesley, who is the brother of John Wesley, he would, a lot of Christians don't know this, he would go into pubs of his time and would listen to the the music of that day that was taking place in pubs. And then he would take that music and write lyrics to it that had become some of our classic hymns today. And a lot of people don't know that, some of the classic hymns that Charles Wesley wrote, some of the original music was actually pub songs. So, uh, and it took place then, it's happened over uh, the many years. And for example, there are a lot of Christian uh, kids songs that uh, kids grew up in church singing many of those songs actually were sung in secular music in the 20s and 30s here in the states so I'm not going to give you any examples I'm just simply saying that that's what took place so uh, here in the life of this church I've, I've redeemed a few songs uh, that I've had fun with uh, took a Beach Boy song Kokomo and uh, made it a mission song how many remember Kokomo when we did that that was a fun one. I enjoyed doing that. And then, um, I'm sorry if this offends anybody, but it's okay. One of my favorite singers is Sting, and I remember taking one of his songs, Shape of the Heart, and I redid the lyrics, and we did it here, and people didn't even recognize it as a Sting song. In fact, I had a lot of, I had a lot of people come afterwards and say, we should write more Christian songs like that. And I said, <laughs> I said if only you knew, you know? <laughs> and so anyway, I, I've, I've had some fun. I uh, was listening to something, and uh, uh, so 
I, hopefully this won't offend anybody, but I grew up in rock and roll, so I still like rock and roll. So I took a, a piece of rock and roll from the 70s, uh, Bachman Turner Overdrive, and their song, Taking Care of Business. <laughs> and instead of it being about, about uh, taking care of business, of just going to work, or about a rock and roll band, uh, I've retweaked the, the lyrics, uh, changed it just a little bit, uh, so you can see I've changed it'll be in capital letters, and uh, retweaked it to just simply say, it's about taking care of his business. Because that's what we're called to do. Taking care of business is about his business. So I've invited Bill and uh, the band to sing a song for you. So hope you enjoy this. Hope you have fun with it. And uh, hope you get into it. So. Before we get started, hey, I'm going to need a little help here, just so you know. Once, with what, once we get going here, you guys can go ahead and clap and join us along. because it makes it easy. You guys know this song, I hear. Uh, please remember. Okay, here we go.
<laughs> Actually, just to let you know, uh, Bill's not sung in front of people before, so that was stretching for him. And we also have some very talented musicians uh, that Gary and Bill, they had worked on the guitar parts before, but the rest of the group didn't, we didn't practice that till about quarter after five last night before the 6.30 service. So very talented to be able to pull that together. Now, I also want to let you know that Bill said something in between the two verses during the music interlude during that. And uh, what he said in that part, take good care of my business while I'm away every day. A lot of people didn't know it. That's actually what Randy Bachman said on the original recording of that song. And because it's on a rock and roll song, people just didn't know the significance of what was being said. That it's actually a quotation, or it's a, not a quotation, it's kind of a paraphrase that he did uh, from the King James translation of the parable of the Minas. And uh, yeah, just a, a little bit about him, just, uh, I wasn't planning to share this, but I'll just, I'll just say it. Um, he originally was a lead guitarist with the Guess Who, and many of you will remember the Guess Who, American Woman, and all of that. Uh, he left that group because uh, he didn't like the rock and style morals, and the rest of the group didn't want to stop doing what they were doing. He was the one who wrote most of their songs, and he just left the group. Everybody was really mad at him. But he had recently become a converted Mormon, and so when he started Machman Turner Overdrive, he made everybody who became a member sign a document saying that they would honor the morals that he wanted them to represent. And he didn't want it to be the rock and, rock and roll lifestyle. So even buried in the midst of that song was that verse where he was trying to say that he was trying to do God's business, which is just fascinating be able to find that out, that even as he was doing that in his way, he was trying to serve God. But he is right. Uh, I, I'm not going to justify what he did by that song, but uh, taking care of business, I want to focus in. We are about, we're supposed to be about the Lord's business. So I want to pray and get started looking at this today. Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for having fun with the song, but more important than just the song, it's the truth that we are now focusing in on. We're to be about your business. Bless this time now, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I do want to take a look at the parable of the Minas, uh, just for a moment. I want to read it to you. I'm going to read it from the New King James Version, and I apologize, I didn't take the time to get it transferred off to, so it could be up on the screen. So I'm going to read a portion of this, of this to you, so you'll just have to listen. Now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 minas, minas or uh, a coin, and said to them, do business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We will not have this man reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants, to whom he had given the money, 
to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you were faithful in very little, have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, You also be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept put in a handkerchief. For I feared you, because you are an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, Out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why did you not put my money in the bank, that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And then the story goes on from there. And I'm, I'm not so much focusing in on the details of the, the parable as much as I just simply want to just show that it, Jesus is telling this parable of this landowner who is away for a period of time, entrusts his affairs to these servants, and he expects these servants to be doing his business while he's away. We all know that the Lord has entrusted his business to us. And that while he's away, he wants us to be about his business. One day, he will return. And it'll be then that he will reward. And, and I'm not going to focus on the reward, but I, I will make this comment. I believe that there's a big difference between doing things for God and doing things with God. I think that there's a lot of things that we have done for God that might not get rewarded. But I think everything that we have done with God, with the Lord, will be rewarded. There's a big difference between the two of those things. But I want to talk about just what is his business? What is this business that we're supposed to be about? And specifically, what can we learn in the Lord's life about it? So when we take a look at the life of Jesus, we can learn a lot of things about what his business was about. One, we know one man who came up to him and just said, Lord, what are the greatest, what's the greatest commandment of all? And Jesus responded and gave these two statements. Um, and it comes in Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 37. In fact, pull it up on the screen. Let's say this together since it's up there. Ready, go. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So Jesus is stating to love God and love people. And it wasn't for Jesus, this was just not some truth that you're supposed to know. It's how he lived his life. He loved the Father and he loved people. And everything that he did was about doing this. He was filled with life in his relationship with the Father. As he was filled with this life, he gave it away to others. So he was filled with love, filled with life, and wherever he went, he gave it away. But again, what's this business that he's about? First time we ever see him refer to being about the Lord's business it takes place when he's 12 years of age. And it, it's not phrased in the NIV translation. It's used in the New King James, so that's why I'm going to use the New King James on this particular verse. Luke chapter 2, verse 49. Jesus had gone with his parents to the temple, and when they, his parents had left, and they didn't realize that Jesus had been left behind. When his parents realized that he'd been left behind, they come back looking for him and are kind of upset with him that they hadn't, he hadn't come with them. And so they challenge him and here's his response to them. He said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Now, when they came back and they found him, what was he doing? He was there with the leadership uh, in the temple, talking with them about the, uh, the scriptures and they marveled at the knowledge and wisdom that this 12-year-old had. So what, they, what was taking place was that Jesus was actually, even at 12 years of age, 
was teaching them a truths about the nature of God, truths about the kingdom, and this is part of the business that he was about. It's the first mention of the business. Later, in the Gospel of Matthew, it will mention the Lord's ministry. And, at, and there will be a phrase that gets referred to about four times in the Gospel of Matthew. Here's the first time it ever gets used, where it describes the Lord's ministry as being three specific things, a trifold ministry. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. So here's the three things that he was doing. Teaching in their synagogues. What was he teaching? Teaching from the scriptures, teaching people about truth and life, teaching about the kingdom, teaching about the, nat uh, the nature of just teaching parables, teaching about life, teaching about people, teaching about God. Then he would, not only was he doing that, but he was pro proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. And often he would state the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What did he mean by that? He knew that as he was in relationship with God the Father, that he was connected to the kingdom of God. And so that the kingdom of God was constantly near because he's the conduit for it. He knew that he was constantly releasing the kingdom of God to be taking place around him because he's the connection point for the kingdom of God to be taking place here. That's why he said, I see what the Father is doing, and I do it. I hear what the Father is saying, and I say it. It's this connection point that releases the kingdom of God to be happening. So that's what is proclaiming the good news is about. The third aspect is healing. Healing disease, healing sickness. If there are spiritual forces that are at work, casting out spirits, that would be a part of that. So the scripture describes his ministry as preaching, teaching, and healing. This is what's happening. This is his business. It's a summary of the business, the kingdom activity, the kingdom business that his life is ministry is given towards. He, uh, and it takes place all the time. He's just given life away every day. Happens in just different forms. Sometimes it takes place in front of crowds. Sometimes it takes place in just, uh, just with one person. Sometimes it takes place with a few people. And it takes place just in incredible ways. One time a, a blind guy who can't see, he, <laughs> I don't recommend doing it, but he does it. He takes some dirt, spits in it, makes some mud, plots it in the guy's eye. You know, and guy said, can't see very well, so praise again, he can see. You know, I see, see men as trees walking. And then does praise again, he can see again. Uh, another time, a woman caught in an adultery. All the people are waiting to see what Jesus is going to do because they can't wait to trap him. And Jesus, you know, because in Jewish culture of that time, a woman caught in adultery is supposed to be stoned to death. Also, by the way, so is the guy. <laughs> we always focus on the woman, but the guy should have been brought out there too. I've always asked the question, where's the guy? Why haven't they brought him out? It's obvious a setup. Anyway, Jesus... <laughs> Jesus, when he responds, he says, let him who's without sin, sin cast the first stone. No one can do it. They all walk away. And he says to the woman, so where, where's your accusers? She looks around, and none are here. And he said, well, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. Very beautiful way how he handles a very scary scene. I love it. I love it when there's this paralytic, this paralyzed man that the four friends lower him. They tear up the roof to lower the guy down into this crowded house. And, uh, I mean, it's obvious what the guy needs. And what does Jesus talk to him about? Forgiveness. Your sins are forgiven you. And the religious leaders, what gives the right to this guy to be able to forgive sins? And Jesus says, oh, well, to prove to you that I have the right to be able to forgive sins, turn to the guy and says, get up and walk. Guy gets up and walks. You know, I love it. 
He heals the guy just to prove to the guy. <laughs> he cares about the guy, and that's why he does it. It's just it's amazing. Just gives life and away constantly. But all this is a part of his business. And then he does this with the 12 disciples. He will send them out two by two, and here's his instructions to them. Uh, Matthew chapter 10, verses 7 to 8. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Hello. Isn't that what he was saying? Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Isn't that what he was doing? Freely you have received, freely give. And if you read on later, you'll see that they actually get to be involved in teaching too. So notice this. With his 12, and, and notice that it's a charge. I'll add this word. It's a command to them. So notice that the trifold ministry, this business that he's about, uh, that he's a part of, he has now given to the disciples and told them, you go do this. The preaching, uh, the, the message of the good news, proclaiming it to be teaching, and the healing have now been passed off to the disciples, and they now get to be involved in doing it. So then they're about doing it. And then after Jesus' death and resurrection, he gives what we call the Great Commission. And we have done a terrible injustice to the Great Commission because we've made the Great Commission to be about simply the evangelization of the world. Okay? But here's what it says when Jesus gives it. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always, excuse me, to the very end of the age. Now what's said there? What is said I give authority to you and to those who follow after you, authority that I want you to make disciples of all nations. So the evangelizing is in there. It's a component of it. But I want you to make disciples. And I want you to baptize in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. We got to do that in the first service. And then he says, and then teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Well, what has Jesus commanded the 12 to do? One thing that he commanded to do, he said, here's the new command I give to you, to love one another. Here's another command that he gave to them, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and to love one another as yourself. But the other command that he gave to them was to go and preach, teach, and heal. That's the other command that he gave to them. So through the Great Commission, he is now saying to the disciples, I want you to teach them what I commanded you to do, teach them to do the same thing. So, this doing the Lord's business was not just an assignment that Jesus had. It's not just an assignment that was given to the 12. It was an assignment that has been given to not just the early church, but it's an assignment that's been given to every single generation of believer ever since that time. So, we can watch in the book of Acts, we see the, 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 the apostles, that's what they did. They were about preaching, teaching, and healing. And in the book of Acts, we can see that their disciples that they had, we can see a few of them. I mean, for example, we get to see uh, uh, Philip. We get to, uh, there's a few other people that we get to watch besides the apostles. And what do we see them doing? They're involved in preaching, teaching, and healing because it was the Lord's business that's been passed down to them. For example, the very last thing in the historical section in the New Testament, as we get to take a look at the Apostle Paul, when we leave him, he's in jail. Now, the jail is a house arrest, but he's chained to a guard under house arrest for two years. Here's the final historical statement in the book of Acts about the Apostle Paul. Here's what it says. He proclaimed the kingdom of God, taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. What is he doing? The Lord's business. He's taking care of business. 
through this whole time. That's all, that's what he's doing. And it's what we are challenged. It's what we're commanded to be doing. It's what the Great Commission is all about. So I want you to turn to the person next to you and just simply say, you are charged. Go ahead and say this to somebody. You are charged. Here's the next statement. To proclaim the good news. To teach. And to heal. Now, how do you do it? Well, can I just say, when it comes to preaching, it's not going to take place this way. What do I mean this way? You're probably not going to be up in front of a large crowd. Like what I'm doing with you right now. That's how I do it. It's the role I get to have in front of you. But it's probably not going to take place this way. When you proclaim the good news, it's probably going to take place with one or a few people. I have gotten to do this in large crowds outside of a church context, but rarely does it happen. It's usually one-on-one -on -one or something like that with people. And, uh, or, or you teach, or you do something, or you give life away, and you do it the way you are. You don't do it the way I am. You don't do it the way somebody else is. You do it the way you are. So I'll share how somebody did something just this week. It's really cute. I, uh, 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 big Brad, Brad McCune, I've, I've shared about him. Uh, he, I shared that a couple of weeks ago he had to go into the hospital with heart issues and that there was another person with a heart issue and he wound up getting to pray for him to accept Christ and the, his, that guy's wife accepted Christ, and then just a couple hours later, that guy died, okay? So anyway, you know, Brad's a, a former Hells Angel biker. Uh, when he puts on his leathers and he's on his, his, his Harley, he still looks like it, okay? Got the long ponytail. And, you know. Anyway, he, uh, so last night after the service, he said, I probably should have told you this story before the message. He could have used it as an example. He said, but I'll, I'll share it with you now. So on Thursday, it was kind of, he knew, he knew it was going to be uh, raining and it was kind of dangerous, but he still, he rode his Harley from Oak Ridge and came into Springfield and uh, wound up coming to Winco. So he pulled into a parking spot at Winco, got, was getting off of his Harley and there was a car next to him. The guy came out, got out of, the, out of his car. Guy saw him getting off his bike with his leathers and everything on. Uh, look like from the, you know from a, a biker crowd and so the guy got out got into a conversation with Brad and uh, Brad said that he knew immediately just by the language and terms that the guy was using that the guy had biker experience in his past and so they're talking a little bit and before before Brad knew it uh, the guy was using you know uh, f this f that and uh, and then, uh, then shortly after, just very quickly, the guy started showing his prejudice to different races. And Brad finally just simply said, hey, gotta let you know, I'm a Christian. I came to Christ about two and a half, three years ago. I live for Jesus now. And uh, your language really offends me. So I'm gonna leave. <laughs> and the guy says, well, I'm a Christian too. <laughs> and Brad said, Oh, really? And he said, yeah, I'm a Christian too. And uh, Brad says, this is just Brad, okay? Brad can get away with a lot of stuff I can't get away with, and you can't get away, he can. He, he just said, and you talk like that? So what do you mean? He said, you're a Christian and you talk like that. He said, well, what's your problem? He said, well, I would think you go to church this Sunday, you should be the first one up at the altar and repent before God for how you talk. Because he said, I had to get that rid of that out of my, that's how I used to talk as a biker. And the guy said, in fact, he said, you got to repent right now. And the guy said, what, with all these people around? He said, why not? <laughs> and uh, he said, furthermore, he said, how can you be a, a lover of Jesus who loves people, and then you talk about people, racial groups like this. What are you, what are you doing? He, he said, Jesus was a Jew. He's from the Middle East. He wasn't white. He was a person of color. 
So why are you, don't you realize when you're discriminating people like that, you're, that's how you're talking about Jesus. The guy says you're right. Prayed for him in the parking lot. <laughs> Now, that's maybe a harsh way to do it, but that's Brad. That's how he functions. And uh, the cool thing is he, people respond to him. And he did do it in love. He really did, even as harsh as it came out, he still did it in love. And uh, I appreciated what he had to say. And, uh, but we're called to give life away. Sometimes it even involves challenging Christians. And, uh, but we do it the way we are. You don't have to be Brad. You do it the way you are. You see, the Lord has us in all different locations. Uh, we all have different jobs. Some are in school. We, some are retired. He's got in all different places. We're all about his business. See, we're just disguised. We're disguised as salespeople, disguised as meal workers, we're disguised as retired people. But we're all about his business. Preaching, teaching, healing. Now that can be scary. Because when you look at yourself, you say, boy, I don't have it in me to be able to do that. That's why something else is important. And I want to talk about it. Today is Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday, uh, Pentecost was 50 days after Passover. And it took place, the first day of Pentecost took place 50 days after the Passover of when Jesus was crucified. And why is that important? Well, it's incredibly important when it comes to this whole concept of doing the Lord's business. So when Jesus was doing the business, when he lived, I want you to know this. Not once when he healed and did things did he ever use his own divine power. Could have, but he didn't. You see, the Bible describes in Philippians that he emptied himself of that right because he came to live as a human, just like you and I do. Because he came to model something for the rest of us to be able to do. Now, if he used his own divine power, and didn't give us his power, then he would have modeled something that not one of us could have done. So he limited himself. That's amazing. God, when he came to live on earth, limited himself. He came to live totally as a human. So where did he have the power to be able to do all the things that he did? He was as dependent upon the Holy Spirit as what all of us get to be. That's why he said one day, the Holy Spirit is upon me to be able to do these things. That's why he functioned in the empowerment of the Spirit to do all of the healing, even the preaching, even the teaching. It all takes place through the empowerment, the help, the guidance of the Holy Spirit in his life. That's why... Jesus would say to his 12, he would say to them before he would die, he would say this, John chapter 16, verse 7, but very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate, the paraclete, the one who's come alongside, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now, I must admit, there's a bit of a mystery to this. Because, see, I'm used to all of us being able to be filled with the Spirit at one time. This seems to suggest that while Jesus had the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit couldn't be given to us. I don't know if that's true. That's what it looks like to me. I don't know. He said, I have to go so that the Holy Spirit can be given. So, I believe that's what is true. And here's what happened. 
as he is just before he ascends to go up into heaven, he will then turn to the same 12 and say this in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He turns to him and says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And then on the day of Pentecost, that first one, is when the Holy Spirit comes in a very dramatic way, rushing mighty wind. Holy Spirit comes upon the early believers that were there. 120 were in this room. And uh, like a rushing mighty wind that came in, and they're each filled with the Spirit, and then they begin to be empowered and gifted in, in various ways. And then what happens with them is that they're able to preach, teach, and heal, and they start transforming the world. Because, see, they have everything they need. They have the authority that Jesus has given to them. The same authority he had, he's given to them. And then the same anointing and empowerment of the Holy Spirit that was on him was given to, a, to believers on the day of Pentecost. It's been made available to all of us. So that now we have everything that we need to be about his business. To do everything that he asks us to do. You know, and I have found the more weak we feel is the more we become dependent on the Holy Spirit and the more likely he is to be able to use us. So I'm not ashamed to be able to declare I'm a Pentecostal Christian believing in the need and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. The Holy, still, Holy Spirit works today, still gifts people today because God still wants us to be doing his business today of preaching, teaching, and healing. And you need his authority, and you need his power to be able to do it. But we're all called to it. I know the difference in my own life, having grown up in a Pentecostal church and was scared to death of the Holy Spirit because of some things I saw when I was young that scarred me and made me afraid of the Holy Spirit. And because of that, in my early years, my early Christian experience, I lived the Christian life in my own strength. And I found two things. It's hard and it's boring. Okay? I'm just going to say it. Christian life in your strength is hard and it's boring. But I know the difference between that and being filled with the Spirit. And with the Holy Spirit's help, it's still hard, but you have his help, and therefore it's easier. And I'll also say, it's still hard, but it's a whole lot more exciting. It's a whole lot more exciting. And that's what God has called us all to be a part of. So, let's be taking, like the song says, taking care of business, only it's his business. Kingdom business. So here's what I want to do today. I'm going to pray and close out the service in a moment. And so uh, some are going to want to leave. That's totally fine. Leave, go take care of his business, okay? Some are going to want to come up because they're going to want prayer uh, for various needs because God's still doing stuff and you might need him to heal or do whatever. We want to make that available for you. And then for some, because it is the day of Pentecost, you know you just need a fresh dose of his anointing spirit. Then we want to invite you to come up and just say that. We just want to anoint you with oil and just pray for a fresh anointing of the spirit. So I'm going to close out the service and just let there be just some ministry that would take place after this. I would ask elders, prayer team people, just if you wouldn't mind just beginning to come on up here, get some oil and be ready for people afterwards. But I'm going to pray, close out the service, and... Uh, yeah, Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for this truth. You want us to be about your business. You want us to be about your kingdom activity, preaching, teaching, healing. You've given us your authority. You've given us your power. You've given us the Holy Spirit to guide, direct, and help us. I pray that, Lord, bless your people as we go. For those who need to go, let them be about your business. For those who need ministry, Lord, we pray 
For those who need to be anointed by your spirit, I pray, Lord, for a fresh anointing that would happen for them, fresh empowerment. And for those who need to be touched and healed, heal people, I pray in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. Hey, God bless you. Have a great day. For those who want ministry, please come on up here. Just come on up right now.